This song was the theme song of a movie which is called China Night. Almost all of us could sing it by heart. And the idea was that we would hear spoken Japanese because the movie was a propaganda film to show that the Chinese and Japanese could get along. Jimmy was older than I was and he got drafted sooner than I did and he went into the January class of the Army Intensive Language School. You know, Jimmy could read Chinese and Japanese fluently. He took his military service Seriously, you know, there was no dissent or any pretense that he was unhappy. Oh, he was happy. Jim Cale was, in a way, the pioneer of, of Chinese art history. He had an analytic way of seeing, and he would look at pictures in a way that was both appreciating but also simultaneously dissecting the image and looking in a way for, for evidence. When our trips to Japan coincided, it would be really fun. We'd go, we'd hit every junk shop, and those shops in Japan, which I see regularly on my in my new life, are loaded with paintings. And you just go in and you think, oh, no, I'm not going to even start. He would open up every one, unroll it, unroll it, unroll it, unroll it, and then he'd say, I'll take that one. Well, do you don't think he was using judgment? Of course he was. He was looking for the most practiced, most beautiful drawing, the most fresh, etc. And it was a good thing he did, <laughs> because he found all kinds of treasures. He never got sick of it. He never got tired. He never even felt normal hunger pangs, it seems. It was just extremely um, impressive, I have to say. But I don't think any of us could keep up with him. One of our first conversations uh, was about his trip with C.C. Wong to Taiwan in the 50s to look at the treasures of the National Palace Museum. Um, he described how exciting it was for a young man who was with a connoisseur, a renowned painter as well, to be able to come in contact with uh, the most important collection in the world at the time outside of China. And he was in charge of uh, opening up this chest, you know of Chinese paintings that had been unknown to the West. Ultimately, just put his name on the map because the Skira publication was very successful. And it was really the first time anybody outside of the museum, the National Palace Museum, that is, and someone who was not of the nationalist Taiwan, to have encountered these uh, objects and, and artworks. He and my first husband, Hans Berwald, were very close. They were both in high school together. So this was Jimmy's introduction to Oriental art. And he spent a great deal of time at the Berwald house, where he became very interested in the art. And he used to say that that was his introduction to, as he called it, high culture. In 1974, he received an invitation from the U.S. State Department to join a group of archaeologists who would travel to mainland China at their invitation and uh, visit all of the great archaeological sites that had been excavated during the Cultural Revolution period. There were works there that people thought had been lost, such as the Spring Festival on the River, this long hand scroll from the uh, 11, late 11th century. Two years later, in 76, he was invited back. With the second trip, he was already a very well-known figure in China. And he then regularly, yearly, was invited back, either to lecture or eventually to stay for periods of time and teach there. We met at the, the International House in Washington, which was a Quaker um, group. And he, uh, there was a piano in the living room and he left his music on the piano, and I told him that if he did that, it would be stolen, and it was stolen. His parents, I think, were divorced when he was very young. Neither of them really wanted him around, 
and my grandmother, meanwhile, was getting remarried. To a man who didn't like the idea that she had a child. And he spent half the time with someone his mother chose who dressed him in lavender linen suits. And the other half of the time he spent with someone his father chose and went barefoot. He stayed at a boarding house on Benvenue in Berkeley. You know, he had this difficult teenage family life with his parents divorcing him, and he stayed apparently with with his friends most of the time. Uh, but it didn't it didn't affect him. He, you, you'd think he'd be sad or depressed or withdrawn or something. Not at all. Oh, he was a very good father. He really was. I remember my father building a ship. I was very interested in whaling at the time and Moby Dick and so forth. And so my dad built us a ship or built me a ship in the backyard out of scrap wood with a mast and a crow's nest that I could climb up to. And um, he, he was very interested in building things, this available wood carpentry that he liked. He had a large collection of 78s and that's the way we would really listen to music. And he would stack them on the on the player, and so, you know, they drop one by one. And that was part of the whole music listening experience for me, was the thunk of the 78 coming down. So he'd get out his pipe, he'd smoke his pipe, and we wouldn't do anything else. We would just sit there and listen to, you know, Mahler's Ninth Symphony, or Das Lied von der Erde, he loved. We did one exhibition called The Restless Landscape. And he, I think there were eight girls. And that was the most intensive seminar experience I had at Berkeley, partly because of the political situation at the time. We visited dealers and collectors and museums to pick out the pictures we wanted to use in the exhibition. And we all traveled together, eight. We went to Cleveland, New York, Boston, and Princeton. And people made fun of him and his eight female graduate students. It was something of a joke to have uh, eight women in a seminar, but Jim delighted in this fact. So when we went to Princeton, we confronted another group of graduate students working with Wen Fang, who was, of course, Cahill's dear friend, but also arch nemesis, as we understood it. You know, they had a wonderfully friendly, contentious relationship over the course of their careers. And uh, his students were all men. So it was a very interesting moment, and I, you know, Cahill has written wonderfully about it himself in his uh, blog and in some of his shorter pieces where he describes the moment when the two groups came together in his hopes that we would, of course, all fall in love and marry one another, and of course that didn't happen. But he found out after we got back to Berkeley that we were being described by our friends at Princeton as Cahill's red detachment of women. He was not afraid to take on the establishment. He was not afraid to take on the Chinese art market, the Chinese art history establishment. He would not uh, kowtow to the cultural authorities, either in the mainland, in Taiwan, or in Europe and the United States. The riverbank caused much discord uh, between us. There were a few people who knew of this painting and one of them was Jim Cahill. This was a painting that belonged to C.C. Wong, who was a very good friend of Jim, Jim's over many, many decades. They're saying it's by Dung Yuan, a painting by someone of whom there are no original existing works, only later copies. And suddenly, in the middle of the 20th century, we get a new painting that nobody's ever heard of before. This is a little odd. So that painting was purchased by the Met. And they decided, because it was such a big deal, that they would um, have a big conference around it. And they invited Jim to participate. C.C. Wong claimed it was an original work by this 10th, 10th century master. Um, Cahill, on the other hand, believed that it was a modern forgery by none other than Zhang Da Chen, who was the, the artist that actually got me interested in the field. He was not alone in thinking this. Sherman Lee, head of the Cleveland Art Museum, dismissed the painting in even more contemptuous terms than Jim did. I went to New York just to be there because I figured Jim was going to be attacked by these New Yorkers who think they know everything. 
and they're wrong. And they hang out that painting repeatedly. I go and look at it again, and I'm absolutely sure it is not a genuine painting of that period. Though the fact is that the debate began with the claim that this particular painting was by this famous artist, Dong Yuan by name, the Metropolitan Museum no longer stands by that claim. It is now attributed to Dong Yuan. But I don't know anyone who, who opened the field to more eyes and opinions and uh, exposed more types of pictures and had a wider ranging curiosity about everything. Jim always emphasized the work of art itself and that's mainly what I learned from him and what I've continued to do the rest of my life. He doesn't make you feel small, but he challenges you. I think that's why I think he's such a great teacher. To me, Jim is not just a person of great learning, a great scholar in Chinese art and um, able to persuade other people to show interest, but also somebody who knows uh, art from other angles, music, films, opera, you know, and, and, and he can talk anything ab about this subject. Those of us who were fortunate to be in his orbit, even a little, were, you know, warmed by the man and his vision. And through him, we were, were warmed by, you know, centuries of art. Not just Chinese art, in my case, Japanese art, but, but all art, music, literature, uh, from ancient Chinese poets and painters to uh, E.M. Forster and others. He invested so much in you that somehow he knew you were going to be great, even if you weren't right then. And it was, I guess, those, that future possibility that made him love us. As a teacher, I think that is really something that I think it takes a, a very great person with a great heart to be like that. He published a book called Pictures for Use and Pleasure, and in it, in the last chapter, he was um, able to describe his um, passion for this form of 18th, mostly 17th, 18th century Chinese painting of beautiful women, or Mei Renhua. And uh, I said to him after I read the book, uh, and that chapter in particular, I said, we really should do an exhibition of this. What do you think about that? And he said, absolutely, let's do it. This area of Chinese painting is rather new, and it's something that a lot of people weren't taking very seriously. And almost everyone who came to the exhibition were blown away by how interesting they were. And the interpretation that Professor Cahill and I worked out were totally new and a huge contribution to the field in a very, very unique area of Chinese painting. You know, he wrote on his blog, he said, the thing that scares me is not death. The thing that scares me is that there's so much in my mind that I need to get out before it's too late. Back in 1996 or so, It's as though he wanted to create this virtual, Im immortal self that would live on forever. And to a large extent, he succeeded, it seems to me. All these things that I think I, I have to be able to ask him and wish I knew more about or just something that I think of and I think, oh, I can ask to add that, and you can't. So, no, it's very, it's, it's, it's very hard. Do you listen? Very much. Yeah. I think everybody does. When I checked on my iPad that morning, I saw the, the email from Julia. <laughs> she just said, the, his, sorry, that was exactly the reaction I had that morning. I just see all the teardrops on the, my iPad. Just all the teardrops. Now you have to admit that was beautiful.